Okay, everyone, yes, it looks like we're recording. So this is, again, Gordon Einstein, your resident Dubai crypto attorney and public speaker. Uh, I have a really, really special guest today. This is this is one that I didn't think I would get for a while, but he's very kind to join us. So Bruce Fenton, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm, I'm, I'm stunned you said yes, but I'm, I'm flattered. So it's so a welcome. Thank you, Gordon. Oh, no, I really miss it. Glad, glad to see you, man. It, it's great. Um, okay, so, there's so much to cover. You're, you're, to use a cliche, you're one of those crypto and blockchain freedom OGs. And <laughs> you're very well known. Uh, you're connected, obviously, with Satoshi Roundtable. You've been involved in a lot of projects. You're working on a lot of things now. There, there, there's a lot to cover. But I always like to start with guests. I always like to give them a chance to... Introduce themselves. Of course, I, I interrupt because that's the kind of person I am. Introduce themselves. You know, where are they from? Where, where do they go to school? What did they work on? How did they come to blockchain crypto? And then maybe their vision. So that's a lot, but I, I know you, you can do it. So let, let me hand the microphone over to you verbally and just please introduce yourself. Sure. Thanks. Uh, so I'm Bruce Fenton and I, I got into the crypto space about 12 years ago, uh, full time. And Prior to that, I was in the investment business. My mom was in the investment business when I was a little kid, and I kind of grew up on the floor of a, of a brokerage firm when I was six, seven, eight years old. I think I traded my first stocks at eight and nine years old, and then I got my first job there when I was 14 years old, and then as basically an assistant to financial advisors. And then when I was 19, I got my license, so I actually became you know, fully FINRA licensed at age 19, and I've been doing that in some form or another ever since, so I've got over 30 years in the financial business. I'm still licensed with FINRA and the SEC. And I've specialized and focused on emerging markets and emerging technologies, which is what brought me to uh, Dubai originally uh, almost 20 years ago, actually over 20 years ago now. And what brought me into Bitcoin and and this whole crazy uh, crypto and uh, digital assets ecosystem. So yeah, I've just been somebody who's focused on change and understanding how the world is changing and what's going on. And that's something I've been very passionate about my whole career there's there's a lot there uh where were you born i was born in massachusetts yeah, oh, and I, yeah and i lived there up until uh, you know off and on we actually we lived in saudi arabia for some years and we've moved around but i was mostly in massachusetts up until about seven eight years ago we moved to new hampshire uh, we signed what's called the free state pledge which is a group of of people who pledge to pursue the maximum role of government being protection of life, liberty, and property. So we we signed that pledge and we dove right into it and became very active in the New Hampshire scene up here, which is a great hub for both, you know, Bitcoin and crypto and digital assets, as well as, you know, freedom and liberty. It's a, it's a great state and it's, it's a nice uh, lifestyle here too. So we, we love New Hampshire. It makes sense. Now, just to believe with obvious, you're libertarian? You know, I, I'm not a big fan of the labels, but yeah, I'm very libertarian oriented. You know, I, I'm a li liberty person. When I ran for office, I ran as a Republican. But prior to that, I had been registered as an independent. Mm -hmm. You can't win as an independent. So I had to pick one party or, or the other between the two. Clearly, the Republicans, you know, the liberty wing of the Republicans. There's very different types of Republicans. You know, yes. people like Rand Paul and Thomas Massey are very, very different from people like Mitch McConnell and Dick Cheney. And I don't have anything to do with the latter, but I really, you know, love the the former. You know, I, I like the Liberty Republicans, Ron Paul, Rand Paul, Thomas Massey, these kind of folks, That that's my people. Um, so yeah, very libertarian, I suppose. Liberty, Liberty Republican is the, the official uh, designation, I guess. Uh, understood. Now, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm just getting to know you, and I didn't know that you had such deep roots in the Middle East. I, I never occurred to me that it was so long. Can you can you explore that a little bit? I mean, you were here early. You were here before Dubai really got built up, and before Saudi Arabia opened. You've you've seen a lot. Maybe yeah, I, I have. It's been a real pleasure. It's changed my whole life. I. Because I'm interested in emerging markets and emerging technology, one of the things I've focused on in my career is figuring out what's true. And I, and especially these days, there's a lot of people, you know, half of America doesn't agree with the other half on basic fundamental truths about what happened and what reality is. And one side's wrong, one side's, you know, right in most, or maybe both wrong in some cases. But yeah. I focused a lot on what was true. And in the wake of 9-11, there was a lot of 
anti-Arab, anti-Muslim propaganda. There was a lot, having been a veteran, having served in the in the military and having these kind of liberty roots, I was very skeptical of this. I wasn't a fan of the first war. I was in during the first war and I think it was a mistake. I think that, you know, they, they you know, it was just, a, it was a bad idea for a lot of reasons. Uh, and in the first war, are you, are you talking about Iraqi invasion of Kuwait? Or are you talking about yeah, this? the first? Yeah, the first. Oh, I was I was in during the during the um, Gulf Storm or whatever it was called. The desert you know, storm. The, yeah, the Desert Storm. Uh, I was in. I was. I served in the Navy during during that war, and I uh, became an anti-war activist after that. I I just thought that we were lied to, and it was it wasn't sensible that we shouldn't have been over there, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of mistakes in it. So after 9-11, there was a lot of anti-Arab, anti-Muslim propaganda. There was a you know big move on that. And and just I, I knew it was wrong. I knew that things weren't accurate. So I wanted to go see for myself. And I went to Dubai. Mm -hmm. the, my first trip was in 2002 because I wanted to see wow. for myself. And it was very, very different then. There was just uh, Sheikh Zayed Road was like half a mile long or so, so, you know one kilometer or something. There was the Hard Rock Cafe, the Doucet Hotel. Uh, I think Emirates t Towers, and that's about it. And then and the and the bird, uh, you know, that's Dubai for you. And and people had talked about. They said, "Wow, they're they're going to have a big shopping mall, and people from all over the Middle East are going to come to this shopping mall, and maybe yeah. it'll work, maybe not." And then a couple of years later, they said, we're going to build islands uh, the size of Manhattan shaped like palm trees. And we're going to build the world islands, and we're going to build the tallest building in the world, and the largest port, and the largest pier, and hundreds more hotels. And you know, I was there watching that. I had a front row seat to it and I kept coming back. And then I started talking to, about this story to Americans. I'd go into- Actually, Sorry, let, let me pause you for a second. There's a lot... I really got to talk to you much more, but uh, let, let me drill on that one for a second. So I'm, I'm here now, obviously in, in Dubai. I think that's pretty well known. And I am inspired by their attitude. Uh, it, it seems like the, the boss says, I want this. And this is usually to be first, best, and biggest with something. Very future yes. looking. And then he seems to go to you know, the, the, the the state and then all the corporatist parts that are part of it and the population in general and say, you decide how, but do it. And yeah. then it seems to actually get done, which is it does. an amazing thing. Um, it's inspirational. But I also have the uh, the benefit and the cost of being here when when it's and it has been done. So I, I kind of you know I, I don't see the process. I don't see the, maybe the bravery that it took. I think maybe yeah. you're you know coming here 20 years ago. Were you qu quizzical about it? Did, well, well, when when they were saying all these things, were you yeah right or let's see how it goes or sounds like a plan, guys? I was a big believer. I I could tell it was real. I could tell that the, the the bold vision of Sheikh Mohammed and the you know the leaders in in UAE and Dubai just you know I I knew they were going to do it. And and one of the things they were doing is um you know allowing people to do more things. If you unleash the power of the uh, entrepreneurs then you're going to they're mm -hmm. going to build. And you know they've had a long tradition of uh listening to the merchants you know there's a I, I don't know the arabic phrase but there's a i think there's a there's a saying that's something like you know let the merchants lead or listen to the merchants or something like that and that's been a, okay something that they believed for a long time so i was a believer right away i saw it and it, maybe even before i came i was like oh i gotta see this because this is exciting and so i came back and i was telling people about it i became like an evangelist telling people about about the Middle East and about Dubai back in, you know, 2003 and stuff when people would ask questions like, you know, well, don't they kill you? Or do they have camels? Do they have cars? Uh, is Al Qaeda a big presence in in Dubai? You know, these kind of yeah, questions. Yeah, in Dubai and, of all places. And then the naysayers were there too, just like they were with Bitcoin and everything else. They're like, those islands are going to sink because our expert engineers have, have it can't possibly work, you know? And I think about that. When I stay in Dubai, I stay at a place on the palm. And I think about that a lot when I look out my window, I say, well, it hasn't sunk yet. You know, it's a regular highway and there's regular people there. It's not sinking, it's a real thing. And uh, so there was a I, lot I think of- Miami things. will sink maybe before this sinks. Yeah, yeah, it's there and then, and they built it. And now it's been incredible. Every time I go back for, for over 20 years, it's bigger and bigger and better. It's 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 beyond the 
dreams of what we could have foreseen, mm -hmm. you know, by 2015 or so, it's like, oh, wow, they made it. You know, this is a real city now. This is this is for real. This is amazing. But mm -hmm. now, you know, almost 10 years later, it's, I don't know, double, triple the size. I mean, it's really incredible. And now I think it it's is, going to keep going. I mean, I, here, my friend, I, yeah. I, I first came here during COVID. I was under the illusion that there was no traffic in Dubai. <laughs> yeah, no. So, and when, <laughs> it's been COVID, a constant like, ever since <laughs> my first trip, I think. I think even my first trip, there was traffic. But, yeah. you know, I could see that but growing to be a, a 30 million person city or a 50 million person city someday. You know, it's 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 done well and it's it's been a model for the whole region. So that's very exciting. Interesting. So you're, you're, one of your initial motivations was you heard a lot of anti-Islamic, anti-Arab rhetoric associated with the first Gulf War, came here, you know, was you were part of that milieu and the, um, how did you, how did you carry, I mean, it's not really blockchain or crypto, but I'm curious about this part. How did you carry your modern, accurate, however you want to call view of the region back once you were outside? How did you get people to listen to you? Did people listen to you? Some did. You know, it's kind of like Bitcoin and a lot of other things that mm -hmm. I've been fortunate enough to be right on. You know, you sometimes just can't make people listen. You know, I've been talking about Bitcoin for 12 years. Sometimes people listen. Most people don't. Most people didn't listen about Dubai. But I did invest and I told people to invest. And those who did, did well. So I came back, I was talking to a lot of investment managers and that's actually how Saudi Arabia ended up contacting me. The, the embassy called me and they said, hey, we hear you're talking to billionaires in New York City about how great the Middle East is and Dubai and you you, you ought to come to our place. We, we've got an even bigger story. So that was my first trip to, to uh, Saudi Arabia was a few years after that. Yeah. And I've been going there ever since I ended up. More that less. was probably, I think I went there like 2006 or something was my first trip. So okay. I was in Dubai, you know, 2002, th three, four, five. And then by 2006, I th I think it was that I went, I did my first trip to Saudi Arabia. And then I ended up doing a lot of things there. I, we, we ended up living there off and on for about seven years. And, you know, similar kind of story, you know, a really interesting story of change and growth. That's very exciting. And, uh, you know, as we mentioned before the call, you know, that's something that I'm focusing on now. You know, this uh, sort of, you know, Saudi, I think, is one of the most interesting markets in the world, one of the most interesting places and, you know, one of my favorite countries, favorite places in the world, for sure. Actually, actually we, we can dive into that, but I, I want to do it as, in sort of a lead up way. Um, so you were you were there before and Mohammed bin Salman. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm bad at this. I really should be better. Before Mohammed bin Salman. Yeah, I, I was there before him. I, I think it was... Um, I think King Abdullah was the king when I first came there. I, I was fortunate enough to meet, I think, two two different kings, um, the current king and the pre and the previous king. So I've seen a lot of change. That Mohammed bin Salman, right? I'm sorry, I, I said, I said that. Mohammed bin Salman is the. I, said, I should have had it engraved in my brain, but I'm so used to saying MBS. Yeah, like MBS. He's he's the crown prince. Right. The the king is King Salman, mm -hmm. and uh, when I first went over, it was King Abdullah. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's been a it's been an interesting time of change in in Saudi Arabia for sure. But, but uh, so what, what I was getting at was you were there clearly before the MBS era, and my understanding, having not gone there myself yet, but I'm being invited, so I guess I need to go. But my understanding was that it was radically different before MBS took over, before this opening. There was opportunity there, but it was different. Was it, yeah, what was it like living there? I mean, what was it like it's, there? It's then? changed massively over the last twenty years. There's when in in our early trips, well, every trip changed. It wasn't it wasn't just the current era. It's just kind of changed a lot, but it's especially changed in recent times. Mm -hmm. But every year I've gone, it's changed. My very first trip, it was extremely difficult to get your phone to work. Like there was no concept of just having your AT and T come over and getting a visa was very very difficult. People would say, "Well, wow, who who are you? How did you get a visa? Like, are you important? Who knew you?" You know, it was a, it was a very very big deal, and it took a long time, and it was hard. And then the next trip I went over, it was a little bit easier. You know, it was a little easier to get the visa. And then I think my phone worked like the second or third trip. You know, or second or third year. And early trips, there was no advertising. The magazines had all the pictures of women were crossed out. You know, so if you had 
Forbes magazine, you know, they, if a woman was wearing a bikini, it would be crossed out by magic marker. Mm -hmm. And there was much more strict dress code. There was much, much, there was no m mingling of the genders. There was uh, no music in public. There was really no advertising in like the airport. You know, there was no b billboards and things like that. Uh, you know, I sent my picture, my last trip a few weeks ago, I sent my picture, a wife, uh, my wife, a picture of the billboard uh, and the the advertising in the airport because the airports changed a lot. You know, we've spent a lot of time in that airport, you know, over the years and that's changed just over the last 10 years. So there's uh, been constant change, you know, construction, of course, you know, there was only a couple of buildings in Riyadh, you know, the big tall buildings. It was the uh, Kingdom Towers and the Faisalia were really the only two skyscrapers. And so all of that is sort of changed. There's a lot of new business, a lot of new opportunities, a lot of new construction, new cities, and and mm -hmm. then a lot of social changes. You know, I was at a at a dinner with some friends on my last trip, and it was just interesting. It's it's interesting for me because for the whole time, and it's a very it's it's more gradual. But if I go away for six months and then come back, which is usually what I do, then I can see it more starkly. I'm like, oh wow, this is interesting. But it was very much just like a restaurant in Dubai. You know, everybody kind of co-mingling, men sitting with women and music in the background. And it's just, you know, very different. It's it's certainly changed a lot over the last 20 years. So a lot to cover there. So the, 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 I think part of the reason Dubai has been successful is it sets itself apart from Abu Dhabi by being a little bit more of an adventure town. You know, if Abu Dhabi has sort of the governmental power and the oil well, Dubai is the flash and the glitz and the, the you know, if you come here and you're single and you want to have a good time, there's that. If you want to come with your family, enjoy the, all the water sports, sports and the shopping and everything else, there's that. It sort of set itself as the anti-Abu Dhabi, but I think UAE has set, set us off up a little bit in contrast to Saudi. You know, Saudi being, you know, big, powerful, but a little bit stiff and conservative. What, what's happening now that Saudi's opening up? Is, is it putting pressure on UAE? How, how, how does that play out? Is Saudi becoming a big Dubai in a way? In some ways, each place has its own character. Like you mentioned, there is a big difference between Abu Dhabi and Dubai, even though they're in the same country. There's just like there's differences between you know Miami and Austin and Boston and New York. You know, just different different places have a different feel, different character, different leadership. So even the cities, I've been fortunate enough to travel all over Saudi, you know, even the cities within Jeddah and Riyadh, for example, are very different. You know, they're just as different as Abu Dhabi and Dubai, I'd say. It's just a different feel. You know, what Jeddah is on the water and it just kind of feels different. Uh, Riyadh is very serious. There's a lot of now, especially there's a lot of big business there. And that, that's where most of the government is centered. So yeah, each one has its kind of a, its own its own feel and flavor. I don't know if one is pressuring another. I think that the success of Dubai has influenced the whole region. You know, Dubai made some early bold moves, mm. and that certainly influenced Abu Dhabi, and it certainly influenced the other countries in the GCC, including Saudi Arabia. And I think that you know some aspects of it. I don't know if they want to be a, a giant Dubai, but I think that all of the countries, to some degree, want to have some of the same successes that the UAE has had. And sure. certainly you know, that includes Saudi. So I think that they've been you know, very aggressive about doing the things that work, whether it's something that worked in Dubai or Abu Dhabi or something that worked in America or elsewhere. You know, they're, All of these countries are looking to do something that makes their country better, makes it better life for the people. So they're looking to embrace you know, what works. And in my opinion, what works is human freedom. And if you look at most of what has worked in the UAE, it's allowing people to do things. And most of the reforms that have happened, especially in recent years in Saudi Arabia, that have worked the best. In one of my earlier trips, one of the first things they did was uh, they started allowing women to work more in like retail stores. First, it was offices. Then it was more like retail. I think that like uh, women's clothing stores were one of the first because so many women complained they didn't want to be having a changing room and, you know, going by lingerie or something and having a man be the attendant. So that was one of the first ones. They said, all right, well, that's that's to protect your modesty. So so we'll do that. And then they said, well, if you can work at the at the clothing store, can you also work at the jewelry store? And now it's expanded. So there's w women, you know, in all kinds of different roles. And that's a great reform. You know, that's a those kind of reforms, when you allow more freedom, when you allow people to do more things, you allow more industries, and you allow more 
you know, more things that can be done. That that's what works. You know, Dubai. It's it's funny. Somebody was I saw somebody criticizing Dubai. They said, oh, they don't have enough zoning rules, and uh, it's like, well, look look how well it's worked. I mean, look at how you know the buildings are very 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 safe, and there's all kinds of insurance and controls and construction standards and things that are met to make sure that the buildings are safe. But what's happened is you you have this massive, massive, massive growth. You have U.S. cities that are just sitting here stagnant where the skyline looks the same decade after decade. And, you know, that's a big price to pay for zoning rules, which probably don't really work and probably don't save lives. So I like the idea of, you know, more human freedom. And I think that's been a a common thread of success in any successful country, whether it's the U.S. or the successes in the EU, and certainly the successes in in Saudi Arabia and UAE. Now, how, how we square circle on something, and we're gonna we're gonna touch the third rail of politics on this one. Hopefully, will Hopefully, I can stay in Dubai. We <laughs> we are talking about hereditary monarchies here, right? We we are we that, that you know there's no there's no denying that's the nature of the countries that I'm choosing to live in and you're choosing to live in. Yeah, you and I are both. I mean, I think I think you're a little bit more. We're both down the libertarian path personally. Yeah, and we're both talking about the freedom that we feel here, which I still haven't quite reconciled in my brain. I'm trying to figure out whether it's a bubble of freedom in an unfree system. I'm trying to figure out whether it matters or not. I mean, I there's the, also the freedom of do I feel safe? Can my wife walk down the street and not get bugged or worse? There, there's flavors of freedom. And, you know, the low taxes or no taxes is a form of freedom. I'm, but again, you know, we are in a monarchy. And I, I'm thinking back to a few years ago. If you know what I'm talking about, I'll be shocked. There, there's this neo-reactionary guy, uh, Medacious Molbug or something. And he wrote all these essays. And I was actually sort of a fan. I, this is probably stuff I shouldn't be saying on recorded video. But I was actually sort of a fan. Um, and his, the whole idea behind neo-reaction, NRX, was that only a sovereign has a proper long-term view to maintain a stable system because they don't need to steal from the they don't need to steal from the future in order to pay off the present to stay in power and I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to I'm trying to understand how you and I as libertarians feel so free in places like this and maybe you can explain it better than me because it's gnawing at me yeah well one thing I do is look at the results okay you know the United States, especially under its current administration, is totalitarians disguised as benefactors. And it was interesting because I used to say authoritarian in a bad way. And I had a friend who said, well, you know, authoritarian is not necessarily a bad thing as long as the authority is good. You know, centralized power can be very good if the person is really looking out for their people. And I think a lot of these leaders, you know, I think MBS and the king in Saudi Arabia have done very, very good things. I think that, uh, you know, Sheikh Mohammed and uh, Mohammed bin Zayed have done very, very good things in, in sure. Dubai and Abu Dhabi. So, you know, I, I and, and if you look at the results, the results are great. You know, you, you, you are, I think they have like three car thefts a year in Dubai. You know, you don't get your car stolen. I have friends who have Bugattis and they leave the keys in the Bugatti and the Ferrari. Uh, they don't, they don't worry about it. I, I heard of a friend, one of the only crimes I've heard about is somebody I heard of, they, they, somebody stole their watch. They went on a date and the girl stole his watch and he called the police. They got the watch six hours later, six hours. If you did that in San Francisco, they'd laugh at you. They could they could steal a million dollars from you, and the police wouldn't even bother showing up. No, in San Francisco, these, they're saying leave leave the keys in the ignition and leave the windows down, just so yeah. you don't get killed when they steal the, the car. Yeah, yeah, the same thing in Canada. These are failed right. states. You know, they're taking people's own, their own your own home from you from squatters in in New York, and you see these footage of people walking into a pharmacy and just grabbing all of the items and running out the door. You know that the, what kind of society is that? That's not working. The, the, what what, the, and, what and, is going and, on? Right, and, and it is unfree. Yes. It's yeah. Not, it's it's you, not free. That's that's the thing. It's like there's a sort of politically freedom, sort sort of. Yeah. You don't have freedom of person anymore. Right. You you have all these negatives, and I feel much more oppressed in the United States. I'm much more worried about police in the United States abusing their powers. I never even see police in Dubai. You know how it is. You, you don't see police very much in Saudi Arabia. You don't see them very much in the UAE. They're mm -hmm. just, they don't have that heavy handedness that we have in the United States where, you know, you've got these guys dressed up like they're going to war and they've got these, these tank like vehicles and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, 
places like New York City where they're barking at you, extremely rude and and uh, you know that that's up in your business. That's an interference in your rights. So you know one thing to do is look at you know how it's working and how how the system works. And the results in the United States, especially right now, are just not good. And the results in the GCC are quite good. Your your big yeah. basic standard of living is is much better. And so uh, and you can and you actually have more freedom in many ways too. You're able to do more with your business. You're able to do more construction, you know, you don't need to, uh, you know, I had to, I had to go and uh, I had to spend $30,000 on lawyers to convince the town of why I needed a, an extra restroom in my barn. You know, why, why do you need a bathroom in your barn? What, what are you doing? And you blah, blah, blah. Is that, is it agricultural use and all of this? This is nonsense that you, that every, every American is, can laugh at this and they know, they know that's how it is. You know, you have people who they have three year battles with the town on whether they can build a deck or not and how big the, the barbecue you can be. You don't yeah. have that in the Middle East. You know, you have much more freedom. You have much more freedom to open businesses and freedom to transact and interact voluntarily. And meanwhile, the government, although it has this, you know, kind of branding of being very centralized power, it pretty much leaves you alone. You know, they you're, you're able to do quite a few things in most of these places, uh, even more than you can do in places like the United States and the UK in many ways. I, I, I don't know. I'm going to push back on that one slightly, but not not in a mega way. So I, I think I think the trick, at least in Dubai, is be compliant and the rules are nice, but you need to be compliant and stay compliant because when, once you draw attention to yourself or you get behind, you know their their fees and licenses are reasonable, but once you start getting behind on it, it. It, there's a cascading effect that can affect your visa and some other stuff, and yeah. it can it can it can kind of spiral out of control. I've, I've had that happen to some clients, and the, you know, obviously they weren't clients at that my clients at that point, but I've had to jump in there and start fixing stuff. And because there's interlocking chains of things, whether it's your medical pass or your visa, or your property, or your solid or everything else, you got you, you got to stop it from steamrolling or from snowballing. So yeah. there, there's there's that aspect. There, there's also there's also customary law here. There, there's the written law, and then there's the way things are, are done. And I'd say in the Middle East, there's a lot more customary law than other places. You need to understand that it's not all written down. And you, you see that in the frequent requirement for a no objection certificate or no objection letter, you know, to use your example, from the EMAC, Damar, or the, the, the big company, the big developers. They will let you do things, but it's up to the, their discretion. So the default is a soft no, but yeah. you can get the soft no reversed by applying and then they give you no objection level, no objection, objection certificate. So there's an element of discretion there. You don't totally control, but yep. there's, it's, it's not, it doesn't seem to be wielded abusively. It's just not quite transparent. Yeah. So just a thought for you. Yeah, there's definitely some, you, you know, and, and if you commit crimes, they're very strict, oh, sure. you know, they, they, there's certain <laughs> things like if you go into the, guys. I'd love to see what would, I wouldn't love to see for the, for the sake of the business, but it would be an amusing thing to see what would happen if you went into Saudi Arabia or Dubai and, you know, ran into the store, just grabbed all the stuff and ran out the door. I mean, they, they would absolutely catch you and you'd be in big trouble. And yeah. that's a shame. You know, how can how can how can we look at it and say that we're better in San Francisco or whatever? No system is perfect. There is some opaque aspects. You know, there's different things. And, and I think these countries are very aware of these. I'm, sorry, of the, clear, I, I'm not even actually complaining. I'm just pointing out that. Yeah. You don't want to let things snowball. And there's an element of subjectivity that you just need to get used to and maneuver it. Yeah, you do have to be careful and you do have to follow the rules. And I think also, you know, the, 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 no, no, nobody's perfect. There's there. One one thing that's been interesting over the twenty years is I've seen kind of this a lot of things free and then and then I do I do sometimes unfortunately see things where there's new rules added on that kind of in my opinion don't belong I think there's a lot of kind of heavy handed you know I I did one of the I did the first Bitcoin conference ever in Dubai and I just did it like you do in America you rent a hotel and you invite people no problem well now. We do conferences. There's there's 10 different regulations. You have to get, you're supposed to get KYC of every single attendee. You're supposed to have somebody uh, look at the 
uh, you know, the PowerPoints and all of these things. I, I'm against those rules. I don't think that that's a proper role of the state. I think it's a it's a drawback and it hinders business and it makes it a lot that's harder. So I, it hurts me when I have things that were easier for me to do 15 years ago and they're harder now. But net net, it's overall, you know, the country has done well. And this is what's exciting. You know, if if they make things too hard, then people move to other jurisdictions. So uh, in yeah, the end, as, as, that, nomad, as nomad capital says, go where you're treated best. Yes, but, <laughs> I like that. I, I like that guy. Oh, so this is all a big lead up towards your new foray into Saudi, which is now happening. And can, can you talk about that? This, this is fascinating. Yeah, you know, as I went into, you know, I've been fortunate enough to go through several of these cycles now. I've been in Bitcoin for 12 years and I was day one on Ethereum and some of these other investments. And, you know, I've seen this happen again and again. You know, you have these boom and bust cycles and I think we're going into a good cycle. And I'm in a fortunate position where I can kind of look at the world and say, what what can I do to make the most impact? What's most exciting to me right now? You know, I ran for uh, United States Senate a couple of years ago. I've done a lot of different projects. I've launched open source. I've supported Bitcoin. I did a lot of education efforts here in the United States, helping to build that, you know, built the Satoshi Roundtable. And this, this idea of Dubai, or, you know, what happened in Dubai uh, inspired me to bring this technology to Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia has been like a second home. As I mentioned, I lived there uh, for, you know, most of seven years. I've spent good friends there. It, the, the place changed my life. I yeah. think it's a very exciting place, a very misunderstood place. There's still misconceptions. It's changed a lot uh, and it's continuing to change. It's going to continue. It's going to be very different in 10 years from now. And so I think it's, in my opinion, the most exciting place in the world. And I think that this technology is remains the most exciting technology in the world. And Saudi Arabia is a bit behind. They're behind where the UAE is, I would say, you know, five, seven years, something like that, quite a ways. Uh, when I was Sorry, just there on my last trip. General or with, with blockchain and crypto? Just kind of, I get a vibe like a 2000, you know, you know 2000. 16 vibe kind of things. You know, okay. I, I was at a meeting with a bunch of people. There was a whole bunch of VIPs at a meeting and and uh, somebody introduced me. Oh, this is the Bitcoin guy. This is the guy who was telling us all about Bitcoin 10, 12 years ago uh, because I was there at the time. You know, I was living there when I was first into Bitcoin and I was telling everybody about it. And then, and then everybody was asking me about it. And a lot of the questions, uh, even very sophisticated people, CEOs, uh, you know, senior government people, they're asking a lot of things that are kind of very basic sort of 2015 era questions. You know, how do you know it can't be hacked? Like, what if Satoshi prints more coins? You know, these kind of things. They're pretty hey. basic. And a lot of the infrastructure, you know, there's a smattering of companies. There's a few companies doing this, but there's not, you know, the major initiatives. I think ADGM brought on... Uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of businesses. DMCC in Dubai brought on, I believe, 600 crypto businesses in the last two years or something yep. like that. They, they just don't have that. They just don't have that level. There's been very few, if any, you know, major kind of conferences. There's there's just, you know, there's not an uh, official exchanges. There's, uh, you know, there's not much guidance from the government on on this. It's just very early yet, which I think is exciting because I, I think I know that's that an opportunity, right? Yeah, they're going to embrace it just like everything else. And they've been very cutting edge on embracing other technologies. So I think they're going to embrace it. It's inevitable that it's going to be part of the economy there because they're doing so many other exciting things. So I think combining those two things and with my background, you know, I, I think I'm the best person there is to do it because I've, I have a deep experience in Saudi and I really love it there. And I also have this, you know, deep experience and a lot of connections in in the crypto ecosystem from working on you know, all of these projects and working on the Satoshi Roundtable and so on. So oh, to sorry. me, I think that's the biggest impact I can have is to bring this technology there with investing. I'm also you know going to be investing quite a bit of my own money and time and and but more importantly, bringing my network there and 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 also educating people there on the ground, you know, talking to people about this technology and how it can transform the economy of Saudi Arabia. When I was jumping in there and you continued, which is good, you actually sort of answered my question, which is you're going there with this intention What's what's your actual what's your what are your actual mechanisms of action? How how are you accomplishing your mission? I think I just so, 
Go ahead. To, to get things done in Saudi Arabia, the, the the best way, and I've been fortunate enough to work on a lot of big projects there. I had some really large clients that did big things in the billions, billions of dollars, you know, of impact at the highest levels. I think to really move mountains in Saudi Arabia, you want to be part of the top-down vision. You want to be right at, right there at the leadership of the, the mm -hmm. crown prince and the king and the senior officials, and you want to get government buy-in. And to do that hand-in-hand -in, -hand in Saudi Arabia, because it is home of the two holy mosques, and it is a very religious-driven system, you really need that religious buy-in as well. So that's my plan. I have uh, uh, Abu Yusuf, or also known as uh, Maui Tucker. He is a, a legit Islamic scholar. He studied for many, many, many years in Medina. Mm -hmm. And he is, in my opinion, at least as far as I know, the world's foremost expert on riba, which is uh, haram, basically. It's debt in the Quran. He's a an authority on uh, riba. It's and debt the, or it's interest? Debt and interest, yeah. Yeah, interest. And and. Yeah. And and things around the interest, and he's a he's an authority on this and Bitcoin. So he's a Bitcoiner, and he's a real Islamic scholar who can talk about these things at the highest level with the the wise sheikhs who are you know, other religious scholars. He can quote the hadiths, and he can he he has the street cred. So I, and there's a network of a, of a number of uh, Muslim Bitcoiners and a few scholars and very knowledgeable Muslims who are very familiar with this. So. Talking to, you know, getting people to understand that it, because if, if people feel that it's haram or forbidden, they're not, it's, it's, it's a non-starter in Saudi Arabia. But if people at least feel that it is permitted by the religion, that's the very first step. And then the, the next step is government. And so I'm going to be, you know, I have a, an open door to be, you know, I've, I've worked as an advisor to government uh, members before, and I have some friends in, in government and I've, you know, certainly have an open door to educate and talk about it. And I can talk, I think, in a pretty objective way about the industry and where it is and what makes sense. I'm not out there selling a project. I'm not there saying, hey, please invest. I'm, in fact, I'm willing to invest. I'm not, uh, you know, trying to push my specific uh, blockchain project or NFT or something like that. I think I can talk from, I've been a generalist in the industry. So I think I can talk, you know, broadly about the whole industry. So that's the other thing I'll be doing is reaching out and talking to a lot of government and just a lot of people, you know, building the ecosystem. There's a lot of, and also bringing people who want to go there. I have a lot of connections. If somebody wants to move their business to Saudi Arabia, or if you're a big giant exchange and you want to create a Saudi office or something, I can put people in the right touch with the, you know, maybe a trading family to be their business partner or put them in touch with government people who can help them get licenses and approvals and things like that. So that's kind of the three-pronged approach, you know, you know, government, you know, re religious angle, education, which goes hand in hand, and then, you know, bringing people in to invest with their businesses, whether it's a startup or a big business that can bring in jobs. Saudi's very interested in jobs. So if you're a big exchange who says you want to, or a big business who wants to move there, you know, that's something that I think has some benefit to the kingdom. Saudi, Saudi is a very young population, yes? Yes. Yeah, very, very much so, which is one reason why the government's so focused on jobs, you know, creating jobs for the for the youth. And that's also, I think, one reason why this is so interesting, because the the youth are all over this. You know, they like cryptocurrency globally and and Saudi, just like everywhere else. You know, they're interested in this. And so that's the other reason that I think it's it's the it's the future. And the demographics are changing, you know, and, and the leadership is changing when I on, on my another difference on my first trips. I'd love to see what the stat was, but the average minister was was quite older. You know, there was a lot of ministers who were in their yeah. 80s, and now you see a lot of ministers who are in their 40s. So it's a it's a big difference. Uh, you know, I mean, it's a it, 50 years. That's, that's a multi generational almost. difference. Yeah, yeah, and and I mean, I remember you know the first conference that I went to, they had a couple panels with four or five ministers each, and they and I, I don't think any of them were under 75. That was just a a, a standard thing in the in Saudi through the the, the 90s and 2000s, where you, you got to seniority by being there a long time. So you had people that worked in these roles and worked their way up and became deputy governor, deputy minister, and then, you know, minister. And, and you know, they were they were older, you know, they were, a, 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 you know, two two generations away now from from what we see now. And it's just a different thing. You know, 40 year olds think differently than 85 year olds. You know, they're educated differently. Almost all of the ministers now 
are, you know, they're certainly very, very familiar with the world. They've traveled. A lot of them were educated outside of Saudi Arabia. You know, they, you know, they understand, you know, they watch Game of Thrones. They understand pop culture references. They, mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they use their phones. You know, it's, it's just a young generation, you know. And, are, are they and then, as disappointed in the last Game of Thrones season as I was? <laughs> I actually liked it. I don't know. I don't know. I haven't got into it with that too many people, but I did bro, think of bro, Game of Thrones because I was watching it when I was way. over there. That they they jumped the shark, but okay, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. We, we you and I can have a disagreement on that point. Um, <laughs> wow. They're, 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 okay. I think I think we can have a whole other show on how Sharia applies to blockchain and crypto and the underlying technologies. I, I've I've been fascinated by myself. I I wish we had hours, but let me. Let me, there's two other things I want to cover and you're being, sure. very, you're being, you're being very generous with your time. Um, you're, I mean, just to be blunt, you're, you're in a group that I've created and semi-managed here in Dubai about crypto. And I was amused to see a, quite the flame war about AML and KYC and the different perspectives on that, that you were nice enough to participate in. So yes, just, I was like, okay, this is a different Bruce. Give me... <laughs> Three or four minutes on your perspective on AML and KYC and how you and how you reconcile that with working with governments. Give me your perspective and then how you're managing that feeling about it. Yeah, you know, I have opinions, strong opinions on a lot of these things, and you're not the only chat room, probably almost any chat room I'm in. You know, I I question things at their source. You know, what why do we have these things? Would we create them if we didn't have them already? Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's a good answer for it. And I have a philosophy. My philosophy is uh, based on the non-aggression principle. I don't think anyone has a right to harm someone unless that person has harmed them first. So when do you have a right to punch somebody or when do you have a right to shoot somebody or handcuff them or tackle them or shoot them with a taser or hit them with a baton? In, in my belief system, uh, this is my personal belief system, uh, I believe that the only time it's legitimate to use force against another person, if it's in defense, you know, if they're about to attack you, or if it's in uh, carrying out justice for a crime. And I think that the only crimes is crimes against life, liberty, body, or property. Yeah. So if somebody uh, steals or rapes or kills someone, or they steal your car, or they smash your car, or they punch you, or they are about to punch you, those are legitimate uses of force. Mm -hmm. You not filling out a form is not a legitimate use of force. And the other part that goes with this is that all government laws, no matter how well-meaning, are backed by force and violence. And there's a lot of laws that I just don't think are legitimate in the, in the world. And this is at odds with my own government. It's at odds with governments in the Middle East and elsewhere. It's at odds with most governments. But I think that the, that the vision we should strive for is to have this non-aggression principle, to have a more peaceful society where, in my opinion, the only legitimate use of that force is if somebody has vi directly violated the life, liberty, and property uh, or body of another person. So if, if you have something that, a crime where there's not a clearly identifiable direct victim, now with AML, KYC, people say, oh, there's victims of human trafficking, there's victims of terrorism or this or that. Those are not direct, they're indirect. There's no no one is no one in the face of the earth has ever been harmed by AML or KYC, uh, you know, lack of AML KYC directly. That is a voluntary action that I believe humans have an inherent right to voluntarily trade between each other, and and I don't believe that it's a, that government has any any authority to you know come in there. Oh well, wait a minute, not so fast there. Let me let me come in there and get in between your transaction. And I also think, and this is a minority opinion with, um, you know, with, with, you know, I think it's immoral. You know, I think a lot of people don't recognize the morality of it. And I think it violates a lot of people's own religious beliefs and other beliefs because there's uh, a lot sorry, of- Can I see AMLs are moral or- Yeah, no, it's immoral because, yes, it's immoral because it's it's not a moral law because ultimately it is backed by force. If I go to a, 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 a here in my own country or any, almost other jurisdictions, and I just say, oh, I'm not, I'm not following that because you, you have what, you know, we have this great American hero, Rosa Parks. She was a woman where they said uh, people with certain skin color have to sit in the back of the bus. Mm -hmm. And one day she got tired from working so hard. She says, no, no, thank you. I'm not sitting in the back of the bus. And I love that. I love that. Nah, 
is a powerful, powerful thing. I did that with the masks. I thought the masks were immoral. I went to school board meetings and things. I said, no, no, I'm not wearing it. I'm not wearing it. And then there, the onus is on them. They have to use force. They have to send men with guns to pull Rosa Parks off of that bus because she wasn't complying with an immoral law. It's the same with AMLKYC. If you set up a new business, if you set up a new bank and you just refuse to do any paperwork and you refuse to do AMLKYC, eventually men with guns are going to come and handcuff you. They may shoot you or kill you. In the United States, we had it's this- It's not even that eventually. It's, it's going to be pretty fast. Pretty fast, yeah. We had a guy- Somebody came up with a law. They said you, you shouldn't sell loose cigarettes in New York City. And this guy, Eric Garner, was selling loose cigarettes and he got in a struggle with the police and they ended up killing him. He died. He yep. died because he, he wasn't harming uh, anyone. I mean, cigarettes are harmful, but he, but he wasn't doing any direct harm. He was engaging in a voluntary trade. So those kind of rules, rules that say you, you, know, you need a form to do this and you need a license to do that and you need professional licensing and AML, KYC, all of those laws are illegitimate. They don't belong in any society. And we should have a peace because they're violent. They're violent at the core. By me, you you, you comply with AML KYC because you're at the threat of gunpoint. And it's not moral to threaten somebody with a gun. You, if I did that as a private citizen, I would be arrested. If I said, hey, you know, Gordon, uh, if you you know, you know don't have enough uh, Marvel Comics stuff in your background, you better do that or I'm gonna put, a, pull you, put you in a cage. That's immoral. I don't have any right to do that. And uh, I do have a right to do if you say, you, you know, if you're, if you're lighting a fire on my farm or something like that, I have a right to harm you, but I don't have a right to harm you because you, I disagree or you're doing some voluntary trade. And that's the way humanity has been for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. We've had this voluntary trade. It's a brand new and really stupid idea. Even within my career, when I first started my career, and Stanley, I could call up somebody and open an account over the phone with yes. no ID, no uh, social security number, and I, they didn't even have to pay me for a week. And I could sell them IBM stock or Microsoft stock. And little by little, because of the Patriot Act and uh, you know blaming it on terrorism or whatever, we've been like frogs in boiling water. And most people who are younger than than me don't even realize this. They think that AML KYC is some sort of birthright of governments that the economy will stop working if you don't have it. But it worked fine for hundreds of years. The the anomaly is now. It's never been the right of governments to to have involvement and visibility on this thing. You have yeah, a human I'm right to privacy. Even with this, what are your Sorry, I'm going to go off track, but it, it's so fascinating. What do you think about uh, central bank digital currencies? Oh, it terrible, terrible. You know, it's uh, because that that enables that's like the natural progression of AML KYC. They not only do they know because here's here's the danger of AML KYC is that it leads to exactly that. It leads to the Justin Trudeau situation where he doesn't like what people are saying, so he shuts their money off. And I think that's wrong. You're talking about and the truckers. CB yes, the yeah, the truckers in in Canada. So if they know who you are and they can shut your money off, that's uh, that's bad. And so CBDCs are a natural progression of that. It makes it even easier. And in a digital world, you don't want to have governments have that power. You, you know, even if you have a benign leader, they have to plan for their future when they're gone. Some at some point, the leader may not be benign. And if you have a bad leader where they have this ability in a digital world, the ability to shut your money off is is a, is a is too extreme. I wouldn't be able to talk to you. I wouldn't be able to pay my internet or even get in a car, you know. They can kill uh, you. How do you yeah. think all your Maslow needs are not going to be taken care of? You're not going to have shelter. You're not going right. to have heat. Yeah. You know? and, there's... and at some point soon, you're going to need air conditioning or else you're going to die. Sometimes and without soon. due process. Yeah. You know. And it's and it's getting worse and worse now. And and they're accepting cash less places. You know, I was I, a couple places recently. They just say we don't take cash. And that's a shame. So, yeah, I think it all ties in. You know, you've got to think about morality and harm to people. And also, does it work? Does it stop crime? Does it stop terrorism? You know, focus your efforts on actually stopping human traffickers. I'm all for that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, stop actual terrorism. Uh, you know, stop the things that are actually a problem. But to burden, to assume guilt on billions of people and to burden entire industries and, and to burden millions and millions of people and make it so difficult to move things around so that you can't pay the way you want, you can't deal with things the way you want, that's a massive burden that's just not fair to the, you know, 99.999% of people who have to comply with these onerous laws when they don't really have much good effect. So, so yeah, I think it's immoral. I would be in favor of scrapping all of it. I don't think we should have any AML KYC laws at all. 
Okay, I, I could do that one for two hours, but I'm not going to. Okay, uh, let's take the last five minutes. Satoshi Roundtable. Yeah. What the heck is it? How did it happen? What's your involvement? Where's it going? So uh, I founded the Satoshi Roundtable with my wife in, uh, it's, it's a little over 10 years now. We're coming up on our 11th year. We just did our 10th one, as you know, in Dubai back in February. And by the way, and, just, I was saying it's a Dubai name. People love it. People fly here for it. Oh yeah, they, yeah, they love it. I uh, hear so many good things. It's, it's super. So I'm, yeah, we're I'm glad, we're I'm proud of it. Here. I think it's 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 certainly one of the very best events in the space. It's it's been attended by a who's who of kind of everybody you can think of in the industry. You know, a whole bunch of Bitcoin core developers, major, uh, you know, Bitcoiners. You know, Safe Dean and Adam Back, and mm. uh, also non Bitcoiners. You know, Vitalik and mm. uh, you know, exchange heads, people like you know Brian Armstrong and CZ and Jesse Powell and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, protocol founders like Charles Hoskinson and, uh, you know, investors, you know, little known people or, you know, old OG stackers who have a hundred thousand Bitcoin and nobody knows their name, but me and there are five other people, you know, there's some really interesting characters that mm -hmm. have come. And it originally came up with the idea. I was at an event and, uh, I was talking to a CEO of a wallet and, uh, we were, and somebody came up and asked how to use the wallet right in the middle of a conversation. And he helped him because that's what good CEOs do. But then we, he kind of joked, he said, man, man, we should have a conference where it's speakers only and no attendees. And I said, oh, that's, that's kind of an interesting idea. And yeah. I had worked on, uh, the global competitiveness forum, which is the predecessor to the FII in Saudi. I had worked on that for a few years and I always thought it would be nice to have a high end conference for the Bitcoin industry, but the industry was very early. So our idea of high end on year one was a club med. And my cutoff was anybody with a million dollar or more business could come. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's just, you know, it is invitation only, you know, we do keep it limited in size, but that's as the industry has grown, you know, that's grown. And now these days it's quite high end. We rent the entire resort, every room, every conference room, every restaurant. We include everything so that people don't have to leave. You know, I, I personally, I just wanted to design a conference that I like. I'm mm -hmm. an introvert. I like talking. When I go to my typical conference, I away conversations and the dinners, maybe more than anything. I do like the presentations too. I like a casual feel. Mm -hmm. I don't like logistics. I don't like, you know, flying halfway around the world and then figuring out, you know, how I'm going to get an Uber and which place has which app for our party and who I need to meet and these kind of things. Mm -hmm. I, I don't like the time suck of that. So I, you know, round table, everything's in one location. Everybody's there, your entertainment, your food, everything's all set. It's a great group of people. We try our best to make sure it's a good caliber of people who are additive to the process. And, you know, with 10 years experience now, I think we've gotten pretty good at it, especially the last six years or so, we've kind of gotten into a good groove. We've mm -hmm. sort of figured out a lot of little details in the special sauce to make the experience worthwhile. And my goal is just to make it worth people's time because time is very, very valuable. It's also expensive too, because we, you know, we do, you know, these big buyouts of the entire resort for five days, this kind of thing. But, you in know, the Dubai. main thing I wanted to, yeah, yeah in Dubai, yeah. It's a yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's you know, so I like to have people have it be worth their time. And I think we meet that bar and we get good response. People keep coming back year after year. A lot of people have been, you know, many people have been eight years. You know, there's a couple of people who've been all 10 years. You know, so there's a lot of people who've been a lot and uh, we, we get good feedback. We get very, you know, almost no complaints on it. So, I'm very happy with it. It's something to be proud of. And I'm proud of the connections we've made. You know, we've we've introduced business partners at these things five years ago, and now they've been in business together for four and a half years. And, you know, we, you know, we've done hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of deals at the round tables, mm -hmm. uh, you know, almost every year, uh, especially in the recent years, you know, we've, we, we've made a, I think a lasting impact on the industry. And I'm also proud that it reflects the industry. Well, it's probably the only event that, you know, Justin Sun and Adam back got a selfie together. You know, you have people, we have Bitcoin max, I, you know, and I, and I think it's a compliment, you know, I have Bitcoin maximalists who say, no, there's, there's too many altcoins there. And I have altcoin people say, no, it's too many Bitcoin maximalists, you know, so it's kind of everybody and, and everybody's welcome. It's and, actually a good sign, right? 
is what yeah, you're I think it's a great sign. I like to reflect the industry. I'm a markets maximalist. I want the ideas to flow and let the markets decide. And as long as you're not a, a scammer or, you know, a con artist, then go for it, you know, go out there and do your ideas and try things and take risks and learn from each other. And I like the cross pollination. People can go to the round table, have very different experiences. You know, the Bitcoin people all stick together, the Ethereum people stick together, and then they, they end up having dinner together, you know, at the, at the breaks. So yeah, I love you're it. You're not so I'm, different. <laughs> yeah, right, right. We do have a lot in common, you know, and, and I'm so I'm proud of the event. I, you know, I'm, I'm we're going to be doing it again this year in Dubai uh, for the third year now in Dubai. Uh, the previous years, it was mostly North America, the Caribbean and so on. So uh, we're going to we're going to do 20, uh, 25 in Dubai again. And uh, that'll be around February. Oh, interesting. So, I mean, 2025. Super. You, you know yeah. what, what I was thinking as you were as you were discussing the vibe. Um, in a way, it's sort of reflexive or reflecting of Dubai because Dubai yeah. has people, you know, I mean, I'll go there. I mean, you got Israelis and Palestinians, you got Ukrainians and you got Russians, you got, you know, Pakistanis and Indians to extent there's an issue there. You know, you got, yeah. you got people from everywhere here, yeah. but it, it has this sort of Swiss feeling to it that is just like, you need to get along. You don't even have a choice. Because mm -hmm. that's the vibe here. And if yeah. you don't like it, you can stay in your room. Right. And be social, but which, in which case, why are you going to buy in the first place? Or you just need to accept that while you're here, you at the very least need to be civil. Yes. You need to be best friends. Okay. And I right. understand a lot of people have a lot of emotions right now. And it, well, a lot of people have a lot of emotions in general, but right now the world is full with emotions. But no matter what, while you're here, you need to cool it. Yes, and sometimes you can go beyond cooling it. Sometimes because the environment mandates your peaceful interaction, you can have conversations you wouldn't otherwise have because it's safer to have those conversations here. Yes, okay? yeah. You had this conversation in London, you might get stabbed. Okay? Yeah, but you you have it here. You know, the worst that happens is someone. You know, it, it's actually semi illegal to raise your voice, and it's illegal to use the bad language here, which. You can say that's anti-libertarian, but you can also say that maybe that facilitates normal conversations. Because as we're, I think you and I both experienced, we're, you and I both experienced the breakdown of civil discourse in the United States. Yeah, you cannot, you know, it used to be that you know Republicans and Democrats would fight and you know they have their opinions, but then go to on picnics together. Yeah, a lot of that's gone. And yeah, you know, you you don't have to hang out. You don't have to hang out with the enemy here. But yep. you can, and you do sometimes. And sometimes, yeah. you know, you find out, oh, this guy's normal. You know, it, it calms yeah. things down. So. Yeah, it is. And, and, you know, that's a great point. You know, there is a similarity between Dubai and the round table in that exactly that, you know, you have this civility and because sort of the whole industry is there, people mm. are on their best behavior. You have a lot of people who get, don't get mm. along at Twitter and then they come to the round table. If you, if you, if you yell and scream or make a fool of yourself at the round table, you're you're kind of wrecking your career. It's not it's not for me. I may I, I've I've uh, never never had to kick anybody out for bad behavior like that. Okay. But um, but it's not about us as organizers. It's like you you don't want to. Nobody wants to make a fool of themselves in front of because you never know who's at the table. Not everybody is a famous face that they recognize. You mm -hmm. know you, you you know people people are very cautious about how they interact because you know they may have somebody that you know that nerdy person over in the corner with the backpack may be the person who has 200,000 coins, who's been in it since 2011, or might be one yeah. of the developers who wrote the code that runs the whole thing. And so people are on their best behavior. And uh, and so you do have these conversations, you know, people who, uh, you know, a lot of times people who get, you know, cri crypto Twitter is a big thing in our industry. So you have people who are at, at odds there, and then they see each other there and they, hey, hey, let me, uh, let me grab you a coffee. Let's, uh, let you know, how you doing kind of thing. And uh, so I like that, but it is a great vibe. It's a great vibe and it does it does reflect Dubai. And Dubai, you know, you have people at all levels from the lowest paid to the highest paid. They're there because it's good. It's similar to the round table. You know, people are doing well. They're yes. making a lot of money. They don't want to rock the boat. You know, wh whether you're a, a day worker or a billionaire in Dubai, you you don't want to wreck that thing. It's a good thing. And uh, no, it's, you know, it's they want to keep that going. Here and like any other privilege, it can be revoked. Yes, exactly. It, it's great here. So why mess it up? Right. You know, if right. you're lucky enough to have gotten a hidden here and got your visa, it's like, yeah. Yeah. That's just there's your rendezvous, right? You know, you, you're not letting everyone in. If you're lucky enough to have gotten your visa and be in there, you know, follow the rules. Yeah. 
yeah, it's it's working so far. It's working pretty well. Wow, this is fascinating. All right, um, you know, this this interview is supposed to be like twenty minutes, but I think we obviously went went long because you're so fascinating. You've, you've done so much stuff, Bruce. Thank you for your time. I know you're super busy. I know you. Get, I know you got a ton going on, and you're you're actually kind of you jazzed me up and got me. You, you gave me some Ramadan things to think about. All right. Awesome. Uh, well, good, good, good to hear it. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. My pleasure. All right. I'm going to stop the recording, but super. Thank you. Thank you.